Another classic of the Galliardic um, style, school, whatever you want to call it, uh, comes from somebody who is still anonymous, not wanting to uh, get too much blowback for these sort of radical ideas that he's playing with here. Uh, but somewhere in the manuscript, somebody attached the, uh, the title, the arch poet, uh, the big guy, chief poet, the best of uh, among them. OK, fine. It's sort of a name. It's as much of a name as many others that we have for whom we have no idea who the hell they are. But he writes a somewhat longer um, meditation on, uh, well, it is a confession which, well, what is a confession? Admitting to something, yes. What does it mean if, uh, well, it, it, here a confession has a specific uh, canonical context. Confession is one of the sacraments of the Catholic Church when you go in and confess your sins to a priest. So here you have somebody saying, okay, I'm going to confess. So buckle up. Uh, he's going to start telling the dirty stuff. You know, who doesn't want to eavesdrop on those things? You, you hear all the really juicy stuff. Seething over inwardly with fierce indignation in my bitterness of soul, hear my declaration. I am of one element, levity my matter, like enough a withered leaf for the winds to scatter. Since it is the property of the sapient to sit firm upon a rock, it is evident that I am a fool, since I am a flowing river, never under the same sky, transient forever. Hither, thither, masterless, ship upon the sea, wandering through the ways of air, go the birds like me. Bound am I, ne'er a bond, prisoner to no key, questing go I for my kind, find depravity. Never yet could I endure soberness and sadness, jests I love, and sweeter than honey what I find, find I gladness. Whatsoever Venus bids is a joy excelling, never in an evil heart did she make her dwelling. Down the broad way I go, young and unregretting. Wrap me in my vices up, virtue all forgetting. Greedier for all delight than heaven to enter in. Since the soul in me is dead, better save the skin. Pardon, pray you, good my lord, master of discretion, but this death I die is sweet, most delicious poison. Wounded to the quick am I, but a young girl's beauty. She's beyond my touching? Well, can't the mind do duty? Hard beyond all hardness, this mastering of nature, who shall say his heart is clean near so fair a creature? Young are we, so hard a law. How should we obey it? And our bodies, they are young. Shall they have no say in it? Sit you down amid the fire. Will the fire not burn you? To Pavia come. Will you just as chaste return you? Pavia, where beauty draws youth with rosy, with fingertips, youth entangled in her eyes, ravished with her lips. Let you bring Hippolytus in Pavia dine him. Never more Hippolytus will Hipp Hippolytus will the morning find him. In Pavia not a road but leads to venery, nor among its crowding towers one to chastity. Yet the second charge they bring, yet a second charge they bring, I'm forever gaming. Yea, the dice hath many a time stripped me to my shaming. And what what and if the body's cold, if the mind is burning, on the anvil hammering, rhymes and verses turning? Look again upon your list. Is the tavern on it? Yea, and never have I scorned, never shall I scorn it, till the holy angels come and my eyes discern them. Singing for the dying soul, requiem aeternum, 
For on this my heart is set, when the hour is nigh me, let me in the tavern die with a tankard by me. While the angels looking down joyously sing over me, Deus sit propitious, huic potatori. Latin joke. Tis the fire that's in the cup kindles the soul's torches. Tis the heart that drenched in wine flies to heaven's porches. Sweeter taste than the wine to me in tavern tankard than the watered stuff my lord bishop hath decanted. Let them fast and water drink all the poet's chorus. Fly the market in the crowd, racketing uproarious. Sit in quiet spots and think, shun the tavern's portal. Write, and never having lived, die to be immortal. Never hath the spirit of poetry descended till with food and drink my lean belly was distended. But when Bacchus, is, when Bacchus lords it in my cerebral story, comes Apollo with a rush, fills me with his glory. Unto every man his gift mine was not for fasting. Never could I find a rhyme with my stomach wasting. As the wine is, so the verse. Tis a better chorus when the landlord hath a good vintage set before us. Good, my lord, the case is heard. I myself betray me and affirm myself to be all my fellows say me. See, they in the presence are. Let whoever hath known his own heart and found it clean, cast at me the stone. Now, a little longer can be hard to follow, but you can just pick out a few things along the way to try and make some sense of it. Uh, seething over inwardly with fierce indignation in my bitterness of soul, hear my declaration. Hear my declaration. He's going to make a confession. He's going to declare his sins. He is seething with this. This is torturing him. And he goes on to uh, list a fair number of sins, spends an awful lot of time on somewhat veiled, opaque uh, sexual references, talks a little bit about uh, gambling, a little bit about carousing, uh, an awful lot about drinking, uh, you know, the stuff of young men in general. I'm not looking at anyone in particular, but uh, this is not a foreign idea. Since it is the property of the sapient, sapient means wise or learned, to sit firm upon a rock, it is evident that I am a fool since I am a flowing river, never under the same sky, transient forever. Uh, a river? Hmm. That's curious. He's identifying himself with a river, not a rock. A river. Now, a river, hmm, I think we can all say it's generally made of water. It's a fair statement. We can go out and run some tests. Even the East River has some small percentage of water in it. But a river is an example of what? Would we expect to find one running through this room? Probably not unless there's a real problem with the bathroom. A river is usually found outside. Another word for outside would be nature. Thank you, yes. He's identifying himself with nature. Nature, that sounds familiar. He's also saying and contrasting that to the rock. 
a rock is stationary, and he makes an explicit reference that I'm kind of uh, all over the place. I'm always flowing. Put aside potential uh, sexual connotations to flowing. But a rock, upon this rock my church is built, is a kind of a biblical Christian reference. A rock is stable. A rock is simple. A rock is uh, dead. It has no life at all. A river, lots of movement. And it is usually a uh, fountain of life. It is evident that I am a fool since I am a flowing river. He's a fool, a little self-deprecation in there. Look at the way that whole stanza is constructed. Since it is the property of the sapient to sit firm upon a rock, it is evident that I am a fool since I am a flowing river. That is a little something we call a syllogism. If then, since this, then that. If this, then that. This is logic. Now, logic of these sorts of constructions were a particular uh, focus, let's say, of uh, church education of the Middle Ages. Elaborately constructed logical formulas for proving the existence of God uh, or some other little point of doctrine were the education of the day, leading right up to a contemporary of this guy who, uh, with um, the figure uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. <coughs> brilliant man who uh, constructed broad, philosophically coherent ideas supporting Christian belief, using a kind of uh, philosophical tradition handed down by the Greeks for figuring out the logic of something, the cause and effect. Uh, and importing that or mapping that over a faith-based objective. That's what students had to sit through. Long, long lectures about logic. They know what a syllogism is because, good God, they have to hear so damn many of them. And here you get the arch poet. Again, probably a young man probably very well educated, probably not all that motivated to buy into a particularly pious lifestyle as a young man, full of all of the energy and chaos that young men are still full of to this day. Again, I'm not looking at anyone in particular here. but he's sort of satirizing it. He's kind of making fun of it. Since it's this, he, you can see him uh, aping his foolish professor at the front of the room. And maybe he's doing it in a funny voice uh, to his friend sitting next to him. Like I'm sure you guys never do to any of your professors who have little verbal tics or something. No. But he's making a joke there. Again, very pious thing, a confession, but he's getting a little sarcastic. He's getting a little uh, edgy. He starts out by suggesting that he's not the rock, he is the river. He is all in motion. He is not still. He is not centered. He doubles over on that with another kind of uh, hoary cliché. The, uh, the masterless ship upon a sea, wandering through the ways of air, 
go the birds like me. More birds, more nature. So that's there. But the ship upon the sea. I'm just like a tempest-tossed boat out there on the waves. I don't know where I'm going. I can't control it. I'm just getting battered by nature, which is God. This way, that way, wherever I'm being sent, I have no control over it. Oh my God, am I going to die? But at the same time, this is one heck of a ride. All of that is baked in. That's another, I would say, cliche. Even then, they had stuff that was so old that they'd be saying, oh, geez. So he's making fun a little bit of the logic and the syllogism. He's making fun of some of the poetic metaphors here, the nature and the ship at sea. He is doing all of this as a kind of uh, meta riff on this stuff, saying, yeah, I know the game. I can bounce around these same elements. I can make it happen. I'm, I'm sampling all these little things, and I'll make something completely new out of a mixture of other works that other people have done. So you're already getting a little distance from the idea of a sincere confession. If he's making fun of the form as he goes along, can we really take him seriously as a repentant uh, sinner? Probably not. Um, he does throw out a couple of questionable lines, however, that always, you know, they could go either way on a number of different counts. Down the broad way do I go, young and unregretting. Wrap me and my vices up, virtue all forgetting. Greedier for all the delight than heaven to enter in. Since the soul in me is dead, better save the skin. Down the broad way I go. Well, uh, a couple things on that. Broadway. Again, translation, but uh, down the city street. Yeah, I'm out. I'm walking around, checking out the sights. Ooh, ladies. Lots of stuff to do out there in a sinful world. Lots of trouble to get into. Some of you are thinking about how perhaps you have done that this weekend. Temptations down the broad way. It's broad because lots of people travel down it. But I would suggest perhaps another reading there. When you enter a church, again, different designs are gonna be different things, but imagine entering into a very conventionally designed Christian church of this era where you come into very large doors and you walk and you can see off in the distance the altar where the priest would stand. On one side there is a long line of pews, the little benches. On the other side a matching line of pews, little benches. And in between, well, there's the pathway that you can walk up so that you can take your seat in one of the benches. And that pathway is usually wide enough to get a couple of people up and down because the benches are very long. And another word for wide would be broad. broad. Down the broad way, some scholars have suggested could be uh, about walking into church and approaching the altar. Hmm, interesting. Wrap me in my vices up, virtue all forgetting. Wrap me in my vices up. Wrap? Wrap me in my vices? Now, that could be uh, easily seen as a reference to, well, you know, I'm just going to 
take all my worst instincts and hold them close because that's where the fun is. And I'm out on the town and I'm just going to own that and I'll be okay with it. Especially if I go to confession tomorrow, it doesn't really matter. But wrapping. Another good word for that might be swaddling. If you are taking a child to be baptized up on that altar, down the broad way, it is generally wrapped in a blanket. Virtue all forgetting. Well, virtue, again, hey, I'm forgetting about all the, uh, the good and bad stuff that I learned in school because I'm just out to have a good time. But at the same time, virtue, vice, good and bad, these are all ideas created by human beings. They are products of culture that seek to emulate the moral universe of the divine, but are still products of humanity. But when you're approaching God on the altar, all of that human culture sort of falls behind you. Now, I'm not saying that this is really what the poem or what the poet meant. I have no idea what he meant. He's not here to tell me. And if he was, he'd probably be wearing a Halloween mask because he doesn't want anyone to know who the hell he is. Because if he's writing about going out uh, you know, uh, drinking and gambling and, you know, girls and whatever, uh, the church would not look kindly on that. And in an era of burgeoning inquisition where torturing heretics is encouraged by the highest official in the church, you got to be very uh, careful about what you put out there. You don't know one way or the other. You don't know if he's writing about getting dirty or if he's writing about becoming clean. Is he flesh? Is he spirit? Is he worldly or divine? He's caught somewhere in between the two, and you don't know. You just don't. And that uncertainty is part of the point. He doesn't know. He starts off saying, well, yeah, this is all bad. I feel bad about this, but he's sure having a lot of fun, it seems like, telling us about it. He's caught in between all of that, too. Uh, along the way, however, he's also bringing us in. It's not enough for him to just write this so that we can all objectify him and say, well, you know, well, well that's, that's terrible or that's noble. Either way, it doesn't really work as a piece of art if we're just sort of looking at it as you know, evidence of what one person was thinking at one time, unless it moves you or, you know, sparks a reaction in you, what good is it? So look at this. Pardon, pray you, good my lord, master of discretion, but this death I die is sweet, most delicious poison, wounded to the quick am I, by a young girl's beauty, she's beyond my touching? Well, can't the mind do duty? What's he saying there? Can't touch, but my imagination is my own. Uh, now, without getting too puerile, meaning 14-year-old uh, boyish, I'm also going to direct your attention to the first word of the second line of this stanza. Master! 
Hmm. That's just sort of sitting in my head. Again, translation, you can never be too sure. But that word is just sitting there. Wounded to the quick am I by a young girl's beauty. She's beyond my touching. Well, can't the mind do duty? I can think about that girl all I want, even if I can't touch her. And if I'm thinking about her in the privacy of my own room late at night, well, nature takes its course. Again, first word, second line, fill in the blank from there. It's funny. He is making masturbation jokes in this poem. Hard beyond all hardness, this. It's not subtle. You can go by very easily reading this and say, well, I never got that. Well, you know, good for you. You are a responsible, upstanding, moral human being. But the slightly more dirty-minded among us who get the giggles when, you know, little dirty things come out, uh, it's funny. If you laugh at this, if you find it at all amusing, or if you find it offensive even, if you are having any sort of emotional reaction to it, well, you're a human being. You are not pure spirit yourself. You are not pure mind. You are earthy, worldly. You are more animal, perhaps, than spirit. The poem is tossing those ideas out there and saying, yeah, OK, we're all the same. We all do it. You know it. We all have the same impure thoughts. We all have the same inclinations. We are all, in one way or another, animals. Or at least that's what we might think. Once we reach that conclusion, we have to shift back and say that, well, yeah, but this is still a confession. This is still him taking the animal nature of his own heart and casting a spotlight on it, saying, let's think about this. Let's dig into this. Let's admit that we all have this, and then maybe we can start to deal with it in context of our other nature, the divine. Because those are two sides of the same coin. The animal, the natural, the physical, and the spiritual, the divine. Perhaps in some characteristics, the intellectual, the elevated. We're not one, we're not the other. We're somewhere on that continuum between the two. <clears throat> and we don't necessarily know at any one point where on that continuum we are. We are always subject to get pulled one way or the other. But that is the nature of human beings, as this poem is laying out, because we are all, perhaps, rivers that move, rather than rocks that sit stationary. Good my lord, the case is heard, I myself betray me. I have confessed to all my sins, and affirm myself to be all my fellows say me. Every story you've heard about me is true. See, they in thy presence are. They're all here. All the friends who have told you all the nasty stories about me. Let whoever hath known his own heart and found it clean cast at me the stone. Which is 
Yeah, that, that, that is biblical. That is, let he without sin cast the first stone. We are all sinners. But if you are setting yourself above that, if you are denying your own animal or physical natures, then you are lying to yourself. And who is more noble at that point? What is more noble at that point? Is it denying your physical nature? Denying yourself the opportunity to let the mind do its duty? Or is accepting that physical nature that is placed in you by God, is accepting that a more devout, recognition of divinity than in rejecting it out of hand. These ideas are percolating just under the surface of all of this. And I will point out as well that after this kind of meandering journey seemingly tossed off the top of this confessor's head, where he's taking us on a little tour of uh, sexuality, gambling, drinking, all of that, you know, all of that sordid stuff. He ends up at a place of morality, at a place of biblical morality, an explicit biblical reference cast at me the stone. So he might have been playing the, uh, the happy good times bon vivant all along the way saying, hey, come on, let's all go have a good time. But he ends up in a Christian reference and an explicitly religious, devout reference to the church. So he's not just Mr. Happy Good Times. He's also, in his own way, devout. He's not one or the other. He is simultaneously both. I am of one element is a line in the very first stanza. I'm not one thing and the other. They are both within me. So you see this medieval culture coming out in little ways in these poems, in these little expressions of um, of beauty. But in order to dislodge them from the merely historical, where we can say, well, this is a good example of medieval art, uh, art of the late you know, 12th century or something like that, in order to actually understand it as art, we need to put ourselves in there as well. We need to read it and say, well, OK, this, this isn't just a, uh, a document of a church confession or something, this sort of pokes at me. This reminds me of my own sinful nature. This reminds me of my own divine nature. This reminds me of my own habits of denying one or the other of them, depending on convenience. Once you have some skin in the game, then it becomes art. <laughs> 